Hi, I'm Chris from Air Windows, and I'm just checking in with people a little bit, letting you know what's been going on. So what I'm doing at the moment is I'm going to put together a video that is following this introduction, and it has to do with me making my guitar isolation cap. Because as you know, I like to say, I'm Chris from Air Windows, and hey, you can do this. My thought is, I can show you how to make this guitar isolation cap, which I just kind of jammed out of pieces of wood. It's not an elaborate scheme. And I think you can do that. My hope is to let people feel like they can do things like that. And so I will walk you through every little step of the, the process that I did. And out the end and demonstrate the guitar isolation cap. It is an unusual design. It took some unusual building. I'll have lots of little white text all over it describing how I chose to do various things and whatever. There was never a formal plan other than there's a little paper model. And yeah, you can do this. Guitar isolation cabs are handy things and uh, hopefully you can make use of one if you have that instrument. As far as other Air Windows things are going on, I've spent a fair bit of time lately working with uh, Paul of the Surge Synthesizer project. And we're building a plugin for Air Windows for VCV Rack. But not just that, as of about half an hour ago, um, Maybe an hour ago, Paul had uploaded an experiment where he was putting in a feature for the VCV Rack Air Windows plugin that we're putting together. And unlike the Clap plugin that I introduced, when it comes out of Paul's machinery, you can use that stuff on Windows and Linux and etc. and etc. He's also got a way of taking the VSTs and letting you type in values into a text field for some of the stuff. So this is, of course, very exciting. And I am eagerly awaiting us being able to do that for a clap version that we can build up that will do the same thing, even though it's based off of a uh, retro generic VST2 uh, code base. If we can make that work, we can probably output things like VST3 and license it all using the GPL, meaning that I wouldn't have to sign off on Steinberg licensing that might take away my ability to do the VST2s that I primarily focus on for retro purposes. There's a lot going on. so. I might or might not continue to disappear for a while, but turns out there's still stuff to do. The uh, VCV rack stuff, I have hopes of getting back into doing live streams again. That'll be when I'm ready to do it. And the VCV rack stuff is not the same as the Rack Windows project, like we talked about in the, the thread in uh, VCV rack land. And yeah, there is such a thing as Cardinal. We're working on letting people also support that off of the same basic code base because it's all open source. You should be able to take stuff and just run with it in other directions and have other things supported on open source. Uh, Paul and I like to, uh, shall I say, shout out the original project source and that would be Andrew Belt's VCV Rack. So we're both pretty comfortable with that and have no problem with other people extending that further in the open source spirit of things. All of the Air Windows plugins are contained within one plugin for Rack. It's out and people can experiment with it. I may or may not uh, link to that in the notes for this uh, YouTube video all the plugins. That's literally every single one. 
that is very different from any previous project because all previous projects attempted to take individual plugins and adapt them so that they were scaling the controls right and customizing things and having a custom GUI and so on. And it always got to about 15 or so plugins. This is not like that. This is a stack of inputs and it just automatically plugs everything in and lets you use it. And the inputs that you're not using just kind of go unattached to anything. And that's like 350 or so plugins available for VCV Rack right now on all platforms. Thank Paul from the Surge Synthesizer from this primarily because all that hard work is his. The 350 plugins, yes, are from me. And between the two of us, it's kind of neat. I was in a uh, conversation about 10x programmers. I'm not a 10x programmer. Maybe I'm a 10x designer. I think Paul is a 10x programmer. When you combine two people like that, you get 100x. You get incredibly productive results and it's not a strain or a struggle. It's just a pleasure. And that's been my experience with this. So I'm looking forward to diving back into my stuff because one of the things that we're doing with the VCV rack and indeed I'm looking to also extend this to the clap platform as well. The intention for this is so that when I release a new plugin I just upload it to the GitHub and upload what.txt and airwindowpedia.txt and all that other stuff just kind of builds like magic. And we're getting really close to making that possible. What that will mean is all this other stuff just rides off of the back of me having a very regular code base. And Paul doesn't have to keep working on it really hard week after week. It becomes a machine that I can just shovel new stuff into. And then everybody gets free updates for all the new stuff as it goes forward. And that's pretty exciting. So, without any further ado, I will see you in this way next time I have a plugin to add to all of this. Me and Paul are going to be working on our machines for spitting out more types of plugins out of what I do. And I hope you like the uh, extended making of guitar isolation cabinet that I've got. I'll see you when I see you. Talk to you later, and I hope you enjoy the VCV Rack stuff. That is essentially what I'm doing behind the scenes, and there's a variety of other things along those lines that I can also do, and I'll see what I can do as far as extending the reach of this stuff. Hope you like the isocab stuff. See you in a bit. Hi, I'm Chris from Air Windows. And here is something that I'm probably not going to be making for you, but in this case, bear with me because you can do this. We're going to make a isolation cabinet. Looks kind of like this. You're going to need a speaker to go inside it. A microphone, like one of my SM57s. I do these SM57s that are uh, modified. And if I'm not mistaken, three pieces of 2x4 birch plywood. If you can't get birch plywood, then maybe 2x4 or something else. Birch plywood is probably going to be better. And you're going to take one of the birch plies and cut it at this diagonal so that it can make either side of the enclosure. The other two, you got to cut into thirds. Once you've done that, you're probably going to lie them down on the ground like with the factory cut side on the bottom and plane them in some kind of way so that they are all the same width as well as the same height. 
because they will be the same height because the boards are likely to match. And then this is all I had for plans of how to put it together. So you can do this. You can, here are some of the measurements that I made from it. You can do this as far as cobbling together a speaker enclosure, much like I did. Just cut the holes in it and make it happen. I didn't have any plans. I didn't align it in any special way. You can see the way that the bottom part comes through. All of these parts need to be closed off with the exception of this part under here. And actually, I believe that I have this. This isn't exactly the way that I drew it because what ended up happening is this middle panel went all the way from the top to the bottom at a slightly different angle and then I cut a hole inside right here and then I cut another hole here. But more on that in a minute. Alrighty, so what we're going to do here is do some things with the ISO cab. So you can see I am trying to build a guitar isolation cabinet. And I thought I would do a little quick video making on some of the points having to do with what I'm doing there. For instance, I kind of made this out of my own head. Um, here is the original model, made out of paper. <coughs> this uh, side shape is actually exactly half a looks like two by four piece of birch ply. Slice it down the middle there, and then you get to use both sides like that. And these panels are exactly a third of a piece of birch ply. So there's uh, one piece that made the two sides, and then if I remember correctly, one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, there are two other two by four pieces of birch ply that make the uh, internal baffles. Now the way these baffles are arranged, you got the speaker hole here, this may be too small of a baffle. I'm still working out how that works. There is a hole through here into this sub part and a larger hole in here. The idea is that it needs to let the air go through because the isolation cap, um, the parts don't have to be entirely sealed from each other. My idea is that with ASM57, it's very localized and it is a cardioid mic. So if the sound wave from the back of the speaker goes through all of here and comes through there, it will allow the uh, speaker to excurse more because it's not compressing the air as much in here but you shouldn't hear the back wave. This is an experiment. I'm not sure how well it's going to work. Here are some things having to do with this. We've got a baffle and I'm going to cut this piece of wood which is from the one of the internal walls. And these are from sealing off. Uh, I had glue in here because these are all non-parallel walls, so I don't actually have them cut to neatly form on there. I don't really have the facilities to do this, so I'm rather unwilling to go into business trying to make these. This is very janky. But the idea is it may be janky in such a way that I can get sounds out of it and not worry too much. If somebody wants their own, then maybe they can like, build their own like I just had to do. We don't need these pieces of duct tape anymore. 
And here is one of the things that you might think about when building something like this. We've got a baffle. And as you can hear, these panels are resonant. But if you have a spare piece of wood, you might put a piece of wood in and sort of glue and maybe a screw. I like using drywall screws on these because I just have a lot of them around. With this one, I might actually trim the edges of it so that it's flatter, but note the difference in tonality. And you're changing tone of the enclosure by bracing it somewhere. The vibrations go through into a different place. Then the other thing is going to be something that I will show you in just a moment. Alrighty. So, Here's my speaker. I'm going to want to put a Celestine Green back in this cabinet and put a microphone on here. It goes in just like this. But there's something else I'm going to show and scamper off for a moment and be right back. I've got this little doohickey, which is the SM57. And where do you place this? Well, one of the things I've got going on is that if I screw it in like this, that is very close to the speaker, arguably too close, but I do have a pivot here where I can adjust it. And if we rotate this, I can aim it more towards the edge of the cone or more towards the center of the cone. So small motions are going to have a huge effect on this. But when designing this thing, and as we can see, hopefully you can see, we can zoom it in more towards the center or farther out and again small motions will have a very large effect. This should be rigid enough that it's not going to flop around although it's probably also going to be picking up a lot of vibration but if I don't like it I'll do something else. But where do you put it? We've got the whole outside edge where I can aim it anywhere on the speaker. Some exceptions, like I can't go over to here. It's placed offset in the hopes that the internal resonances are going to be um, less additive. Like if it's exactly symmetrical, then any reflection inside there the immediate reflection is going to be exactly the same on both sides. So I wanted it to be offset. But what we're going to do now is put the sidewall on and then tap the speaker and listen to what that sounds like. So without the sidewall you got that with the sidewall. Obviously very different, but the reason I have this here is because I was hearing a resonance when I did that, because it's a fairly small, I'm gonna have it really live, I'm gonna have it really open. 
And so I thought I would get a staple gun and some glue and put a sort of fillet inside here. Do I have a better piece to demonstrate this with? Yes, I do. <laughs> Put something in sort of towards the the edge there, maybe not completely up to the very edges so that there's a, a space inside. If you had a rigid thing like this, it would be what you'd call a Helmholtz resonator, meaning that sound that would get into the inside space in here, it'll tend to resonate at the frequency in there. Air will try to come through into this closed off space, but since this is uh, carpety felt like stuff, that's going to have a damping effect. And if I have it completely sealed off, if it's, if it's flat, it's just going to be a diaphragm, but if it is a curve, well that contains pressure, but since it's felt, it doesn't perfectly contain pressure, so it will have a damping effect. And we can even maybe almost hear what that sounds like with that one piece. You'll see more of this momentarily. That's without any damping. And then without even gluing it in. Just sticking it on there in that curved shape. Not much of a change, but maybe a little bit of a change. I'm going to be wanting to do that. And then, it'll be a matter of tapping in at different places on the cone, or flicking it with my fingernail. And I'm going to want to listen to the sound that gets produced by that. I'm listening for a sort of reverb-like sound without many tonal characteristics. If I find the correct spot, that's where the microphone should be pointing at. And uh, we'll do that momentarily. I just have to move all of this so that I'm pointing the camera down at the speaker. Alrighty. So, this is what I was talking about. Here's the speaker. It's hooked into, I've got this felt in here. And let's see if we can tap it and see what it sounds like without the sidewall. We've got this. And then the sidewall is going to be um, screwed on across all of these different uh, panels. As you can hear, it's a pretty beefy thump. And you hear a slightly different tone depending upon where you tap. So I'm going to flick it with my fingernail making a more high-pitched sound and listen to the tones that that produces. Yeah, like I don't really like this spot. Sounds kind of flimsy. Whereas that's a little better, but that's still close into the center of the cone. Whereas I'm probably going to be wanting to mic it out the up near the edge, so that's going to have a lot more to do with what I'm trying to figure out here. So that's interesting. There's a certain kind of sonority going on there.
there I hear a bit of a sort of a honk. Wouldn't want that spot. Whereas there's more of a uh, weight behind it as I go around. Here where it turned from a sort of papery, clangy light thing to a real thud. That's more focused. And what I'm shooting for is a sort of balanced effect. Oop, sorry about that. A sort of balanced effect that's maybe kind of like a snare drum or whatever that's uh, more complex rather than a, a simple resonance going on. This will also have to do with the locations of these wires here, which are glued into the cone. This is what some folks from back in the day who were really good at mic and speaker cabinets, I'm thinking of Tim Jaleeser, talk about taking your SM57, which is a very directional mic for this kind of thing, and just moving it tiny amounts until you find the perfect spot on the cone. This is what we're exploring with, with this peculiar little exploit. So I will continue to do that and see if I can find a result. And I won't be able to use a spot here because I won't be able to mount the... Well, I may or may not be able to mount the um, microphone thing on the sidewall. But if I mount it along the edge here, I can drive the screws through into this space where if I mounted it there, I might be driving the screws out the side of the cabinet. That would be no good. So I don't like this area very much. But this is not, this area is not bad might also be able to make a sound from scraping it with my fingernail. Or indeed scraping these ribs, then I get a low frequency sound. See, this feels kind of bright and light to me. I don't like the resonance there. Of course, it has more lows here. I think I am finding a location which is in this zone here. So if I put a microphone here, I should be getting a sort of collected and defined tone out of the speaker cone. Out towards the edge, a little rounder. the center it's still not all that like bright and rattly but when it's driven through the uh, the uh, voice coil miking closer to the center of the cone even if tapping it isn't making a brighter sound there's going to be a brighter sound for two reasons one is that the uh, microphone's pointing closer to the cone and high frequencies are more concentrated around here and also the way that I've got it set up in order to point towards the center of the cone, I have to tilt towards the voice coil rather than away from it, which gives a great deal of adjustment from moving the uh, microphone 
away towards the edge or in towards the center, small adjustments will have really big results that way. And again, if we were over here, there's a funny sort of tone quality there. It's not quite the same. And the reason is the sound is looking at a different acoustic environment inside this enclosure here but also the resonant qualities of the cone are slightly different because of the placement of the wires here, the way it's assembled. So over here we have a funny kind of resonance going on. Whereas over here, sort of to this side of this wire, which is pretty much lined up exactly it might have something to do with the fact that there is a um, piece of metal right behind it. So actually capturing from behind this piece of metal, it might just be that the sound waves coming back in. Also, I've got this brace here. That has an effect too. The sound waves coming back in have to bounce off the back of that uh, piece of metal so the immediate internal reflections can't go right back out this point of the cone. Whereas if you were to the side of it, the sound can bounce into the insides of the baffle and then back against the cone directly. Whereas here, there's the piece of metal in the way stopping it. I could even get kind of fancy and put a piece of foam on the inside of that piece of metal in here if I wanted to get real fancy and do a little absorption right there. Could be worth a shot. And that is how you jank your way into a speaker cabinet that hopefully is good. Uh, we'll be finding out about that soon enough when I have it put together because I'll be doing guitar recordings using this. It should be, I mean, it's birch plywood. It should be good at keeping the sound in, so it's going to work as an ISO cab. Whether it works as a great sounding ISO cab is another question entirely, and that's the point of this exercise. So I'm doing the best that I can with it, and I will talk to you later. Bye-bye. Hey, you caught me in the middle of uh, still making this. I just wanted to show you what I had done. Remember how the inside of this, this is the spot to tap in order to get a better sound out of the thing? and that it reflected off of the inside of this metal part, like that was blocking sound waves coming back through the cabinet. So I mentioned I might want to put some kind of uh, foam or something in there. And so this is some foam. It's like pick and place foam from a uh, camera case. And I've made a sort of triangular wedge on that. There's a little bit of super glue in there and a couple of sort of bolt and suspenders like pieces of string also holding it on and that is now on the inside of this basket so that the sound directly coming off of the uh, speaker although granted in all the other ones it'll still bounce on that spot where the microphone is going to point there's going to be a tiny bit of low fre uh, high frequency absorption there and that's going to 
control the sound just a tiny little bit. I'll continue putting everything back together again and hopefully I will get to show you an isolation cap. There's a reason I'm not setting up to make these commercially. I'm not the guy for that. I should be able to make one. Hopefully it'll be wonderful and you'll be able to hear it and I'll be demonstrating plugins through it maybe making a plugin that sounds like it why is this not letting go hmm. there we go I was trying to go the other direction same deal put it through direction and then back. Come on you. What I'm doing here is I just have like simple wood screws. They're actually drywall screws and uh, that's perhaps not optimal. And washers and the thing with the washers is I want the washers to sit on top of this cork here so that um, and it wants to be I had it squared up so I want the washers to sit on top of there so that it can compress the cork a little tiny bit and then that will tend to suppress rattles and buzzes Whereas if it's just a straight metal on metal connection, then the slightest amount of loosening will make it capable of rattling and buzzing. So there's a little bit of flexibility in there. This is a place where I do not want to strip this because that will just guarantee rattles and buzzes. And that is mounted in. And this is going to go to a uh, jack that will be around here. There's also going to be a, a microphone XLR jack that's going to be around there. And I'll be soldering those with my uh, soldering iron, which is here, and warming up or heating up too much. I turned it down to low from high. And let's run and get the uh, other panel. Here's my other panel. And we'll go together kind of like this. I'll be putting lots of those screws. I'm going to take a uh, straight edge like a measuring tape, mark exactly where the middle of this line is for all of these lines and then mark it on the outside of this and put holes in for this is this is weird why is that there it's a piece of something that was glued onto it drill holes along exactly the lines that will go to the center of this birch ply and then there will be a lot of screws holding this side on because this side is going to be the access panel not the front but the side and Down like this. And that's what it sounds like tapping on the speaker inside here. Oh, my finger went through. No, just kidding.
and uh, I'll catch up with you in a bit. I keep, there's a screen where I'm looking. I, there's a screen where I'm looking, so I keep looking at that instead of the camera. Ready. I have the microphone thing stuck on. This is sort of from a uh, automobile sports cam mounter thingy doohickey, which I attached to a guitar, I mean, a microphone. It's kind of wobbly. It holds a microphone. I can change the angle of the mic using this. And in fact, it will also turn this way a little bit, but it kind of resists doing that. And so I thought what I would do is find the exact right spot, which you won't quite be able to see, but maybe if I lean it over, you can. Tapping on the phone. here. So if I aim it, the microphone should aim pretty much there. This may or may not work, we'll see. See momentarily. Thank you. 
And there you have the isolation cab. Looking forward to getting to use it. Later.